Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Asia now has top priority for American foreign policy, as Barack Obama announced in 2011. The rise of China and the advent of the Asian century certainly explain this U.S. pivot to Asia. But while the region has become the economic engine of the world, many political, historical, and territorial disputes remain unresolved. How America and the countries of East Asia can navigate this so-called Asian paradox of strong economic integration yet high political tension is what we talked about with Robert Kelly, Associate Professor for Political Science and Diplomacy at Pusan National University. Professor Kelly obtained his PhD from The Ohio State University and focuses on international relations in East Asia. He is an avid blogger, runs the Asian Security blog, and writes regularly for The Diplomat. Professor Kelly has also written for Newsweek in Korea and Japan and contributes to the Lowy Institute for International Policy. Professor Kelly, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me. What brought you to Korea in the first place, and did you make this country your permanent home? Um, I actually came to Korea on something of an accident, I suppose. Um, I had finished my PhD, and I was working in a small school in the United States, um, in a small town. It wasn't particularly interesting. And um, I had a very good friend who was a Korean, a former student from many years ago. And um, I had not been to Asia. I'd never sort of been out here. And it was um, a really great opportunity. And it's since evolved into something really substantial. I had originally, I had not actually written my dissertation on East Asia. I had thought I would actually do other things. I came here and things really changed. I actually thought I was going to write about the IMF in my career, but living in Asia changed that, so here I am. What distinguishes you from many um, commentators on East Asia security affairs is that you live here. Thank you. How did it, how did it influence your opinion on politics in, in the region? Probably in kind of like a skeptical or kind of pessimistic way. Um, in the 1990s when I lived in Europe, it was sort of the high point of the European Union project, and it very, very much made me sort of an international relations theory a liberal. That is, that I strongly believe that you know we have these international organizations, and they're overcoming national boundaries, and nationalism is in decline, and multi, you know, sort of transnational projects like the euro are on the rise. And I worked for the German government at the time, which is particularly pro-European. And then living in Asia, I've sort of been struck by the opposite. Right, Asia strikes me as, and I say this a lot in my writing, it's very nationalist and very statist. Right? I mean, if you're a realist, you love Asia because it really looks like what realists tell you Asia or states are, right? Sort of the eggshell model of states that don't get along. They have sort of constant grievances and scraps and fights and frictions and stuff like that. Asia very much fits that kind of Waltzian model of international relations. And Europe really doesn't anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, Europe is actually more interesting for international relations theory than Asia, right? I mean, one of the reasons why... Waltz and Mearsheimer and all these other guys, well, Waltz, of course, has passed away, but, you know, Mearsheimer and a lot of these other guys, Friedberg and stuff like that, the realists pile in to Asia is because Asia fits the model, right? And so living in Asia has actually has made me much more skeptical now. Now I actually think that nationalism is a much greater force in international relations than I ever thought before, for example. It doesn't make you more for realists in that sense. It does. Right? It does. I mean, not normatively. Normatively, mm -hmm. you know, normatively, I'm still a liberal at heart. Normatively, I still believe that international organizations are good things that states should try to get along. I think nationalism is a very dangerous force. Um, I think nationalism in Asia easily escalates into racism. I think that deeply entrenches Asia's conflicts. But as an analyst, empirically, yes. Now, I, I much more now accept the persistence of national identity and the persistence of the state as a unique form, right? I mean, the whole idea that sort of states are collapsing or disappearing or being overwhelmed by international organizations or NGOs or big global social trends, I, I don't believe that anymore. If you read my dissertation, it's a very different, it's a very different take. Um, how has your views of North Korea changed now that you live in South Korea? Any impact or any um, new items there? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my understanding of North Korea is much more differentiated than it was before. I mean, before, back when I lived in the United States and I taught this stuff, I think my understanding of North Korea was what you might call classic Cold War conservative. That is to say that I saw North Korea as the, the failed communist analog of South Korea in the same way that North Vietnam was or East Germany. And now that I'm here, now that I've actually been to North Korea and I've actually learned more about Korea, particularly Korean nationalism, I see increasingly that North Korea is really only a Marxist state on the outside that actually in many ways North Korea is sort of fascist or kind of like a gangster state actually right I've actually argued this 
myself, I don't actually know that much theoretically about organized crime, but I often sort of think that North Korea looks like what would happen if, say, like the Corleones from the Godfather film took over a country, right? You have sort of like El Jefe at the top and all of his friends and all of his buddies around him and they're all interrelated by blood, right? And what are they doing? They're shaking down everyone they can. They shake down their own people. They shake down the international community, right? They live this kind of like wild lifestyle of parties and girls and drinking and everything else, right? And Kim Jong-il was legend for how much Hennessy he drank every day and stuff like that. You know, once you actually sort of open up North Korea, you kind of find out that it's even worse than we thought, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, right? It's much worse than East Germany ever was. Let's talk about the involvement of the United States in the region. The Obama administration announced a few years ago its pivot to Asia. Right. I think some commentators argued it was more rhetorical than anything else. Okay. Um, what's your What's your uh, evaluation of the pivot to Asia? I support it. I think it's a good idea. Um, I, I think that uh, the rise of China to the world's second most important state is undeniable. Um, I think that China is surrounded by vibrant economies as well, including Japan, South Korea, Australia, India, um, perhaps in the future Indonesia, Vietnam, places like that, right? And, you know, so Asia is important. I mean, there are a lot of people that live out here. There's a lot of money out here. There are a lot of very populous states out here. As those populous states get wealthier, they will buy weapons, which means the frictions out here will become substantially more important, right? You know, Al-Qaeda is dangerous, but only in kind of like a minor sort of way, right? I think we often sort of balloon into... Um, you sort of out of control, out of proportion, the, the threat that terrorism, uh, for example, raises. You know, we have sort of a few people get killed in a car bomb or something like that. That would be nothing at all compared to, say, like if you had a war between Indonesia and Vietnam or Vietnam and China, right, where you would actually have like real militaries fighting. So in that sense, I think that Asia is actually really significant. Big demography, big economies, military spending. So we should be, we should be more involved. In that sense, I, I support the pivot. I think it's a great idea. Um, I do, in my own writing, I have emphasized, however, that I think it's very hard for the United States to pivot out here because of the cultural distance between Americans and Asians. That is to say that like, Americans are much more culturally vested in the, Middle e in the Middle East because of religion and in Europe because of a shared cultural past. And that makes it hard for the U.S. to pivot out of NATO, out of the Middle East to Asia. Right. Now, you could argue that, well, the United States can do all three at the same time. I would argue that it's actually very difficult for the United States to maintain four regional hegemonies at the same time. That is to say that the United States is dominant in the Western Hemisphere, in Europe, in the Middle East, particularly in the Gulf, and also in East Asia. And it's very hard for the United States to maintain all four of those at the same time at a period of the rise of many other states, the BRICS and whatever. This doesn't mean America's in absolute decline. It does mean the United States is in relative decline, and I think it will be forced to choose, you know, maybe not now, but in the future. And, and, you know, I think the Chinese are aware of that. So every time the United States gets involved in a Middle Eastern war, like this one against ISIS, the Chinese in their background clapping their hands. They love it because the more we get sucked into ISIS, the less we have to devote here. Opportunity costs are real, right? Even the Americans can't do everything. So if we can't get out of the Middle East, we can't stop fighting there, it will be harder for us to move here. And that's sort of my, that's my long-term concern. And I've, I've written about this extensively. So is this a Huntingtonian view, so to speak, that America needs a, a civilizational enemy to, you know, sell its foreign policy to uh, its domestic audience, and it's m more easy to sell a Western, uh, sorry, a Middle Eastern jihadist than to sell China? I think I think many Americans think that way. I do not. Right. I do not. I tell, for my my own opinion. I mean, nobody cares what I think, but my own opinion is that. The, the terrorist threat is wildly overblown, that Islamic radicalism is driven in part by a lot of Western intervention in the Middle East, that if we weren't there, a lot of these people would be going after one another or, or turning their own states upside down rather than targeting Westerners. That's my own belief. I think a lot of this is blowback. But, you know, I mean, there are, I, I'm loath to use that expression, class of civilizations, because... The civilization for Huntington was really a proxy for religion, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where Huntington broke down in Asia because Huntington kind of wants to say that... He wants to say Confucianism is a religion, but he can't because it's really kind of not, right? Um, and that's why he's forced to create a Japanic civilization and a Sinic civilization, even though no one ever knew that Japan was an independent civilization all by itself like that. I mean, he just made it up. The class civilization thesis just doesn't work here very well. I think it's better to just sort of look at it in like a re regional 
way, like a geographic spatial way, and just say that the United States is involved in a series of regions. Some of those regions are really significant core interests for the United States and others are not. I would argue that Latin America and Africa, for example, are not core regions for the United States. I think a lot of Americans would say Latin America should be. I, would, I do not think it is. I think Asia is of greater importance. I think the, the bigger concern, though, is just can the United States do everything? I mean, should the United States be this sort of global cop that is everywhere, right? And I mean, a lot of Americans want this. I mean, I, I do not. I think it's I think it's a fool's errand. But, you know, the, very much, the, the Republican Party very much, I think, believes in this. And I think sort of the centrist Democratic establishment in the United States, you know, Hillary Clinton, Brookings Institute, I think they broadly accept the idea of, of American global cop. The question for me is, can we do this? One, one, can we afford it? Two, does this mean perpetual war? Because it looks like it in the Middle East. Right. And three, does it, is this going to create massive blowback? Right? Are Asians and Middle Easterners and stuff like that? You know, this is Thomas Johnson argument 20 years ago, right? I mean, if we intervene in everybody's business, I mean, at some point, are they going to punch us back in the face? And this is how Chalmers Johnson explained 9-11. And I would argue, to a certain extent, this explains a lot of our trouble in the Middle East, is that there's sort of a Muslim backlash. If you want to put a Huntingtonian gloss on that, I'm you know, a little right. wary about that. But certainly, I think Al-Qaeda and ISIS and many Islamic groups in the Middle East, they see their actions against the United States through that Huntingtonian lens. It's very clear that bin Laden, for example, thought Huntington was right. But can America not be the global cop? Can they really disengage from the Middle East right now? Who would then, you know, play that role? Or should we just, should the West just leave that region alone for the time being? Uh, that's that's a really mm. big question. Because um, I think my point here is that, as you said, you cannot be an hegemon in, in all the, the areas right. of the world. And it seems that the Americans had a bit of bad luck here because at the moment they tried to get into this pivot to Asia, they have this very explosive situation in the Middle East with ISIS. So what would happen or, if we left? I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, ISIS, ISIS primarily is targeting other Muslims, not Americans, right? I mean, if you watch the videos where they behead those unfortunate men... Um, they almost always say this is in response to XYZ. Mm. Um, we could support locals to do it. ISIS is a much greater threat to local states, including Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and so on. And so it's kind of strange. It's kind of strange in a buck-passing kind of way that the Americans are taking the lead because ISIS is actually a much greater threat. I think, for example, if we were not so much involved, the Saudis might back off on their on a lot of the Wahhabist pathologies, I think, that helped to spread this stuff. I think if we were not so close to Israel, the Israelis might actually draw a compromise with the Palestinians, which I think is another thing that, that adds to this. Um, I think America's involvement in Egypt has almost certainly turned the population against us because we seem to be on the wrong side at every turn, right? We supported democracy, and we didn't support democracy, mm -hmm. and now every serious faction in Egypt has reason to distrust us, both the Muslim Brotherhood, the population, and the military. And so this is what I worry about, right? I mean, I just am not sure. I mean, this is kind of like a sort of an imperial question, right? I mean, if you're going to be, you can be like the Romans, right? You kind of like butcher a lot of people and then divide and conquer, but we're not going to butcher a lot of people. That's not consonant with American values. So when we intervene in these places, inevitably what happens is we start manipulating local elites and local opinion and everything else. Locals find out about it and they get upset, right? Think about the Iranians in Mossadegh, right? I mean, the Iranians are still complaining about the overthrow of Mossadegh in 1953 by us and the Brits, right? I mean, I'm just not sure if these things help us in the medium term. I mean, I understand in the short term, I mean, I won't hit my ISIS as much as everybody else, but I also know that the more we fight them, the more we get sucked in, now we're involved in Syria, so now we're involved in another internal conflict in the Middle East, and these things go on and on and on, right? I mean, look at Libya. I supported the Libya intervention. I, I argued for it for a long, for six months, and now I kind of feel bad because now Libya is basically, it's, it's civil chaos with the possibility of Islamic insurgency. You know, I don't know. These are big questions. I don't know if we have time for all this kind of stuff. Mm. My only concern, I guess, for our purposes is that the more we get sucked into these places, right, the more they become quagmire-like, Vietnam-like, and the harder it becomes for the United States to direct its attention elsewhere. The Americans may have enough money and ships and whatever to send to Asia, but there's more than just that in terms of opportunity costs. There's the time for the administration. There's the time of the president. Does the president have enough time to actually read books about China when mm. he's reading about Iraq all the time? I mean, people just don't have these these expertise, right? The more we're spending time running around the Arab world, right, the more all of our expertise are going there in the CIA and DOD and everything else, and the less people are focusing on Asia. The fewer people are learning about North Korea, learning Chinese, learning Hindi, and so on, right? It isn't just a question of money, right? And that's why I don't like this whole kind of we can chew gum and walk at the same time thing, right? This is what CSIS always says, right? You know, we can run the Middle East and we can pivot to Asia. I don't think we can. I know there's a lot of money, but there's more than just money. There's bureaucratic attention, there's focus, there's time, right? All these things have strict opportunity costs. The president is now entering his uh, lame duck 
phase of his presidency. Sure. Does this mean we can expect much more regarding the pivot, or do we need to wait for a new administration to come in and see, you know, more drastic changes or more assertiveness there? The pivot is his legacy in foreign affairs. You know, he made an effort at a deal with the Palestinians, right, an Israeli-Palestinian deal, right? Every president for 25 years has tried that and missed, so that would be the real gold ring, but, you know, who knows. But the pivot to Asia is probably his big legacy, unless... Uh, the transatlantic partnership thing comes through. But if it doesn't, the, the, the pivot will probably be his big for the pivot and the surge, you know, sort of his return to Afghanistan and stuff. I guess the, you know, like I said, I mean, the, the big question is that, that can he, can he sort of keep the momentum? I mean, if you actually turn on the American news, if you turn on CNN and Fox and MSNBC, they're not talking about the pivot, right? I mean, they're talking about the Middle East and there's got to be public opinion support for the pivot. There's got to be public education to support the pivot. Just putting more army divisions in Japan or something like that, or sending more aircraft carriers out here is not enough. People need to start learning the language. The bureaucracy has to start turning in this direction. Universities have to start teaching this stuff and not the Confucius Institutes, which are subverted by the CCP. I mean, real independent institutions. We've got to start getting more foreign exchange students over here. We need students going to Singapore and Indonesia, and we're not really doing any of that. So far, the pivot, the pivot is basically, it's military. I think it's quite clear that America is interested in peace and stability in the East Asian region. Is there any American master plan as to try to solve or at least stabilize all the latent conflicts in the regions? I think the American government is too disaggregated and too dysfunctional for a master plan, really, in anything. Um, the, the United States is a very open sort of separation of powers, checks and balances kind of system, right? Um, where we just don't, where there's just no one figure who speaks with a really, really authoritative voice on foreign affairs. Um, it's much worse, of course, in domestic affairs, but there's nothing like, say, like in Korea or Japan where the chief executive really does speak for the country and there's just no competition. Again, in the United States, you can see this where the president and the Congress, the Republicans in the Congress, have had very, very different interpretations of what's going on in the Middle East and it's made it you know, difficult for the United States to, to act. So I don't actually think there's a master plan. I would say there was just sort of like a sketch, mm. I guess. Um, and the sketch broadly is to, is to tie China into rules. Containment, if we have to contain them, nobody wants to say that, but that's what air-sea battle really is. It's containment. But we only do containment, right, if uh, tying China into rules does not work, right? And the whole idea is that the Chinese will you know, follow UNCLOS and things like that, right? the UN Commission on the Law of the Sea. And from what I understand, there's a sort of growing sense at PACCOM, Pacific Command, that, the Ch that this really isn't working, that the Chinese aren't really going for this, and that increasingly we're sort of swinging towards deterrence and containment. Certainly the Koreans want the former, right? The Koreans don't want containment because that would force them to choose. But, you know, I think the Chinese, the Chinese rightfully look at the American effort to tie them into rules and say, you know, you guys don't follow the rules, right? After 9-11, you know, we tortured people and we invaded countries who we went around the UN and this and that. You know, we sort of like bomb without any kind of international sanction, right, permission from any kind of meaningful body. You know, think about ISIS, the president just decided to do it. So if you're Xi Jinping, you look at the Americans, right, and you say, hey, you just do whatever you want, so we'll do whatever we want, right? I mean, if the Americans are going to say, for example, that the Chinese should follow UNCLOS on the Parasol Islands or the Spratleys, which I want them to do as much as anybody else, mm -hmm. then the Americans should ratify UNCLOS, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we haven't ratified UNCLOS, but we're telling the Chinese they should follow it in their Southeast Asia disputes. I mean, come on. I mean, this is just, I mean, this is kid stuff, right? I mean, come on. But you go and you say this to, like, the Republicans, the Foreign Intel or the Foreign Relations Committee, and you're going to say UNCLOS is a violation of American sovereignty. Right. Okay, well, then you can't turn around and say to the Chinese, you should restrict your sovereignty according to something we will not, right? This is like when, you know, like when the Washington Post complains about Chinese military buildup at the same time that the United States represents 45% of global defense spending. I mean, give me a break, right? I mean, this is, you know... If we're gonna if we're gonna demand the Chinese follow the rules, we have to follow the rules. And since 9/11, we haven't followed the rules. To be perfectly honest, very well, right? I mean, countries like China will never forget that we tortured people, that we invaded Iraq around the United Nations, that we launched the drone war without any kind of international permission, and they will use that against us. Let's talk about North Korea a little bit. Um, sure. What role does North Korea play in the context of American engagement? Is it a, an essential threat to the stability of the region, or is it just a a dog barking on the side. Yeah, that's actually leverage. a really good question. Or is, is it, it actually a useful idiot? Maybe I should also ask that question. Useful idiot for whom? In the sense that uh, it's a good opportunity for the United States to have a lot of military bases only an hour away from Beijing. Uh, oh, well, that's probably what the Chinese think. <laughs> um, although you could argue the other way too, right? That North Korea is a useful idiot for the Chinese, right? It keeps the Americans distracted on right. North Korea not paying attention towards Taiwan. You know, I hear this a lot, right? That the reason why the Chinese prop up North Korea is because if the Americans weren't paying attention to that, 
you know, to the Kim family circus up there, then the Americans would, you know, flowing the pivot toward Taiwan instead of Northeast Asia. Yeah, and sort of North Korea is kind of hard to, on the one hand, in a very traditional geopolitical sense, North Korea is in very obvious decline, which is to say that North Korea doesn't really represent the kind of like Leninist imperialist threat that it did 30 years ago. You know, after the Americans, after the Americans lost in Vietnam, Kim Il-sung went to the Soviets and the Chinese and he asked for permission to invade South Korea again. Yeah. And in that sense, I mean, you know, back in the day, you know, this is like, what, 75, 78, the North Koreans were still a sort of genuine frightening threat, right? I mean, they looked like that robotic, authoritarian, autocratic society of the future. 1984, everybody goose-stepping through Kim Il-sung Square and ready to march on Seoul and all that kind of stuff. And then all that just sort of blew up, right? And then we learned in the 1990s that all that sort of communist autocracy actually masked social failure and dysfunction and everything else. And these systems were actually very, very rotten on the inside. So in a geopolitical sense, no. I think in a sort of like a like an economic fabric kind of sense, though, North Korea is actually sort of a local threat. They do, for example, a lot of people don't know this, for example. They, uh, they produce a lot of meth. And mm-hmm. this is spreading all over Northeast Asia from what I've read. I mean, again, it's all sort of underground. It's all illegal, so we don't know. They counterfeit a great deal. They commit a lot of insurance fraud and stuff like that. So in some ways, North Korea is like a like a predator on the, the pathways of globalization. The, the North Koreans are always sort of like leeching off this system that was created around them, right? They trade in dollars and they steal things and all this kind of stuff. And they commit a lot of fraud here and there and stuff like that. So in that way, they are a problem, right? That they sort of chew away at the foundation, the economic foundations of globalization that we want to build. Especially out here, right? Because we need that interdependence to keep the Chinese and the Japanese from fighting. But I mean, in a traditional sense, no, I think North Korea built its nuclear weapons primarily for deterrence. I think it's highly unlikely they'll ever use them against Tokyo or Seoul. You know, unless the Americans are like kicking down Kim Jong-un's door, you know, like Hitler in the bunker or something. And then Kim Jong-un, you know, with a pistol in one hand and, you know, a bottle of scotch in the other is going to push the button. Because, I mean, once you, you know, once you launch against a major city in Japan or South Korea, then that's the end of the Kim family, right? They'll be executed. The Americans will come in. Everybody will come in. The Chinese will say, okay, you can wipe out the entire Kim family. So I don't think that North Korea really is that kind of a threat anymore. Conventionally, they haven't been a threat in a long time. Yeah, let's talk about territorial disputes in Asia. Um, For many visitors to the region, it seems strange how the relations between countries such as China, Japan, South Korea... Uh, can be wrecked, so to speak, because of these very small patches of territories right. like Tokto. Um, so how would you explain this reality to someone who's not familiar to the region? A couple of things. First, I think a lot of these are left over from pre-modern or sort of the Confucian diplomatic period, basically before the Opium War. You know, before then, the borders out here weren't really drawn with that level of specificity, right? I mean, people just didn't know exactly to whom did Dokdo belong because, you know, there was like one guy living there and he maybe knew somebody from Japan and then his grandfather from Korea came over one day, whatever. I mean, you just Mm. didn't have these kinds of... This obsession with sort of like where exactly the lines are is what happens when you sort of import the Westphalian system onto a cultural space that just didn't have that before. I mean, you see some... You you know, where you can really see that problem, of course, is in Africa where, where the borders are just... That really fake. They don't fit at all. In the Middle East, it's the same way. And you kind of have the you have this problem also in in Asia. Now, I mean, it's less so in Asia because the the national systems in Asia are much better established. Asian bureaucracies go way back. Borders in Asia have generally been stronger, but still, you have some of these bits and pieces. And I think um, for the Koreans and the Japanese, these disputes have been a useful nationalism sort of rally around the flag nationalism whipping boy right you can always sort of say oh look at these you know bad outsiders and stuff like that and say you know we should you know all support the current regime you know the current government or something like that because they're standing tall on Senkaku or or uh, Dokdo I think for the Japanese I think the Japanese would probably actually give in on Dokdo except that Japan is in three territorial disputes two of them with Russia and China and so if the Koreans Japanese gave in on the Dokdo dispute with the Koreans, where I think they don't actually care that much, it would send a signal to the Russians and the Chinese, and I think that's why the Japanese hold the line on Dokdo so much. There's actually very little sort of Dokdo or Takashima fever in Japan, right? The local prefecture that claims it has a Takashima day, which is, I believe, in February. So the local prefecture has this sort of day and stuff like that, and they get a few marches and stuff like that, right? But it's the Koreans that really go over the top on this. It's the Koreans that have turned Dokdo into, like, this national symbol, and they, like, rip up Japanese flags and public, and, you know, they have the soccer player with the sign that says, you know, Dokdo, what is it, our country, Dokdo Udinara, or something like that, right? I can't, remember what, I can't remember what it was. And I think a lot of that is because, right, the South Korea kind of defines itself against Japan, and that's why the, the Koreans talk a great deal about Japan. 
And so the role of Japan in history, and to a certain extent, they use Japan to help define themselves. In part because they have a lot, of, they have a hard time defining themselves against North Korea, because there's a lot of sympathy in South Korea for North Korea as an independent state that sort of stands up to the Americans and the Japanese, and so on. And so the South Korean government really can't be as sort of anti-North Korean, I think, as it would like to be. Certainly, as anti-communist hawks in the South Korean right would like. Instead, what the South Koreans do is they kind of define themselves against Japan, and Dokdo has become the symbol of that antimony, that, that, that antithesis, right? We are the anti-Japan, and we will sort of struggle over Dokdo. And I think it's kind of like that with China, too. I think the fight in Sakaku for the Chinese is very much a way of saying we're going to push back on this external enemy because the last thing the CCP wants to do is talk about internal reform and all the horrible things the CCP did when it was really running the country. You know, Mao killed 20 million people in the Great Leap Forward. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that that's vastly more Chinese than died at the hands of the Japanese Imperial Army. So instead, let's focus on Japan. Now, that would be my interpretation, right? There are very powerful domestic politics reasons in both South Korea and China to beat up on Japan. doesn't mean that Japan Japanese shouldn't be better about World War II, they should, but a lot of this is domestic. Part. It seems in, in China the implicit deal is that the Communist Party can stay in power right. if there's economic growth. Right. Do you see a risk if the, if the growth falters that to try to divert the attention away, um, China would try to get more active into the Senkaku area, and there it could really get messy, right? I think Absolutely. that the, Japan has now inaugurated this new um, helicopter career, which is the largest in the world, and of course they immediately sent it there. Um, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think that's actually a very accurate de de depiction. I think the CCP, I think their big problem is effectively legitimacy. Communism is dead, so it doesn't make any sense that China is run by the Communist Party anymore because nobody believes in it anymore. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't believe in it anymore. So why exactly is it run by CCP when the Cold War is over and, and redistribution is over and Maoism is over and everything else, right? So I, you know, and so the, what I think has sort of fallen into place instead is nationalism, right? Particularly under Xi. And um, yeah, I think it'll be, it will be very tempting. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the scenario you laid out comes true, right? I mean, if, if China's growth will not stay above 7% forever, right? I mean, the Chinese said the other day in the global warming agreement that their emissions will peak in 2030. I mean, if you use emissions as a proxy for growth, right? More emissions when you have more growth. That means that the Chinese expect their growth, you know, their sort of like super growth phase to probably peak sometime in the next two decades. In other words, as Chinese growth comes down in the next two or three decades from seven to six to five to four, as it normalizes in the next three or four decades, if you've got all these Chinese middle class families who expected their kids to be able to walk into a 7% growth economy and find a job immediately and suddenly they don't and you got 10, 20, 30, 40 million unemployed young Chinese men running around or something like that and they can't find wives because of the gender imbalance, well, you can always roll out the <laughs> Japanese, right? You know, and that's I, and this is what I worry about. This is what I worry about. And there's actually been a whole sort of discussion in, in international relations about how the Chinese have sort of switched from communism to, you know, patriotic education after Tiananmen Square, and the focus of patriotic education has been Japan. And again, to me, it's a national identity whipping boy. It's not really about what Japan is or isn't or whatever. It's China as the anti-Japan in order to sort of create some kind of like an enemy image, right? right? Mm -hmm. But Japan today is not what the Koreans and Japanese say it is. Today Japan is a fairly good global citizen that, that follows human rights and liberalism and democracy and everything else, right? But nobody wants to talk about that here. The, what they want to do is stay focused on the war because that has a really powerful political potential. So if you look at like South Korea, for example, they talk about the comfort women all the time, but they never talk about the millions of people who have died in the gulags in North Korea. I mean, the North Korean human rights situation is vastly worse than the issue of the comfort women. But the comfort women is politically consonant with their prejudices and beliefs and everything else. But nobody wants to talk about the fact that another Korean people is up there butchering its own people. That just doesn't fit with South Korea, with nationalism here. So they just don't want to talk about it. And I think the Japanese are the same way. The Chinese are the same way. We don't want to talk about what happened during the Great Leap Forward, right? So we'll just ignore the fact that Mao let 10, 20 million people starve to death. Instead, we'll focus on Japan, even though Japan hasn't been like that since the 40s. And to me, that's, that reeks of politics. That's not history. That's, that's politics. When we look at the Senkakus or the Daoyus, depending on how you want to call them, sure. um, it does have a lot of implications for America, right? Because Yeah, we're going to get sucked into it, right? So what would happen, and I know this is a bit of fiction, sure. but what would happen if the area was truly in contention, right. militarily speaking? Right. That's like the $10,000 question, right? I mean, you answer that question, it'll be on CNN every day. 
you know, the president, President Obama, came to Japan, what, like a year or two ago, and he, when this was really hot, and uh, six months ago, eight months ago, and he said that the treaty covers Senkaku. That's the big turning point, right? In the last year, he said that, which means now, I, I assume he's not lying, I assume we should take him for his word. That means that the Chinese use military force in the area in a serious way. That means we will get chain ganged in. I, I can't see it happening any other way. Certainly, if the Chinese try to take the island, that said, I think we will probably do the very best we can to sort of slip and slide our way out of that and allow Japanese Coast Guard forces and fishermen and, you know, policemen and firemen and whoever else is running around on the island to sort of fight back. No, right, because if you're the Japanese, I mean, because a lot of these territorial disputes in Asia are actually fought this way, right? They're not actually fought by open military forces, right? You don't have Chinese destroyers ramming Japanese destroyers. Instead, what you have are Chinese fishing boats ramming into Japanese small Coast Guard boats or something like that. They sort of promote the claims without militarizing them, which might actually force a real conflict. I mean, and that, that's one of the arguments that sort of these territorial disputes in Asia are not going to actually spin out of control, because right now they're not actually being fought by real military forces. They're being fought by these kind of like paramilitary forces, right? They're being fought by you know, firemen and, and, and police and boats and, and coast guards and fishermen and stuff like that, right? I mean, this is what happens, right? You know, we arrest these Chinese fishing boats or something, and the captain goes nuts and he, like, stabs a Japanese sailor, and then it's a big story, right? Mm -hmm. But the good news in that story is that it's not the military. So if the Chinese militarize it, that's a big step up. Right now, we'll probably say, you know, hey, the Japanese Coast Guard can contain these these rogue Chinese fishermen and stuff like that, right? If it actually turns into the PLAN, the, the Navy, then it's a big deal, right? Right. Um, Northeast Asia, that being said, is, you know, very integrated economically and socially to some extent. So does this uh, situation uh, restrain all these actors from pulling the trigger? Or do you think it's still possible to have a first world war scenario, so to speak, to, such as Europe? Yeah, sure, sure. This is a great IR theory dissertation question, <laughs> actually, <laughs> right? Because you have basically a liberal interdependence argument out here that says they're all tied together. The costs of war, because they're tied together, will be extraordinarily high, and therefore they shouldn't fight, right? If you sort of accept rational bargaining theories of war in which costs and benefits are calculated rationally by states, you if you accept that, right, then the Chinese should be thinking about Senkaku not just in terms of ideology and nationalism and emotional sort of we have to get those Japs or whatever, right? Instead, they should be thinking, you know, what are we going to lose if the Japanese take all their factories out or something, right? I mean, that, and that's what we're hoping, right, is that the, the rationality of the liberal argument that we can actually make money working the Japanese is going to trump the racist, nationalist, get those Japs, whatever kind of argument that's probably also floating around Beijing. And that's what we're hoping. That's what we're all hoping. I think the big concern is that it didn't work in 1914, right? That a lot of people made exactly these kinds of arguments 100 years ago. The one thing I would say that's different this time is that this time there are nuclear weapons in Asia, right? right? And that nuclear weapons have so far had a pretty good restraining effect. If you look at the Soviets and the Americans, if you look at the Indians and the Pakistanis, nuclear weapons have actually, you know, had a sort of nuclear peace, right? Waltz argued this, a kind of nuclear peace restraint effect, right? Nuclear weapons make war so dangerous that states don't go to war. Right now, if the Japanese and the Chinese were actually getting into a conflict, Japan, of course, is not a nuclear power, but the Americans are an ally. So you have an implicit conflict between two nuclear armed states. The world hasn't seen that before. So you know, either nuclear weapons or liberal interdependence is acting as a constraint. If I had to make a guess in the future, so you can call me back in 10 years and say I was wrong, um, I would say that the Japanese and the Chinese will not fight a major conflict for at least 20 years because China is still too far behind. I think the Japanese Navy would beat the Chinese Navy, the plan, without too much trouble, certainly with American assistance. As China continues to grow, if it builds a more serious Navy, it could actually contest Japan, but it'll take 20 years to do that. And, and, you know, hopefully the Chinese national ideology will have changed by then, right? I mean, hopefully China will not be focused on sort of anti-Japanese nationalism. If the Chinese are still talking this way when they're even wealthier, then it's going to be much scarier. You know, right now China is kind of scary because of the way they talk, but not so scary because they're not as wealthy yet, right? But as they get wealthier and build more and more stuff, then the, the threat becomes greater. So you mentioned how territorial disputes are very important in defining Korean nationalism. But at the same time, there's, I would say, a more positive sign in, in Korean nationalism, which is this pride about the Korean wave and, you know, this right. self-perception of Korea as an advanced country. Could this, you know, maybe become more important in defining what Korea is and put these territorial issues aside? Or is that, you know, three arrows and there's nothing you can do about it? I actually think the Hallyu thing is is pretty overrated. I it's think a fad? 
Mm. Yeah, I do. I think that, you know, I mean, Korea, look, I mean, Korea is a modern state with a film industry and a music industry, just like any other one, just like France or Canada or whatever. And every once in a while, you know, these different industries are going to crank out hits. They're going to go viral on the internet or whatever, right? Gangnam style and stuff like that. So the idea that like Korean culture is like uniquely conquering the world or something, that doesn't really impress me particularly well. I think a lot of that's rock G ideology that's promoted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think the real, the, the real issue is, is um, what really sort of ties them together and gives them identity is, is nationalism, right? I mean, I, I strongly believe that Koreans really do believe in the Minjok, right? And the idea that Koreans are like a unique people with like a unique, you know, sort of history and language and, you know, maybe even race. I think there's actually a great deal of racism in Korea that goes unmentioned, um, certainly by Koreans. You know, all you have to do is just turn on an Arirang television and they're always talking about how Korea is 5,000 years old, which anthropologically is just nonsense. I mean, that's just, you'd never meet an anthropologist who would tell you that you could have a coherent culture that could survive 5,000 years. I mean, that's just, and the idea that Koreans today would be identifiable to Koreans 5,000 people in this place 5,000 years ago is just laughably ridiculous. That'd be like saying modern Egyptians would recognize the pharaohs. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just, this isn't real. The, the real issue, what we're really sort of reduce a lot of this kind of like overreaction and and sort of these wild claims about Korea being 5,000 years old and this and that and everything else would be unification. I think the real issue that what, what makes the what really disturbs Korean sense of identity now is that there are two states there are two states and one people um, sort of the opposite of the Palestinians right we have two peoples and sort of crammed into one state right you know and what this means then is that the two Koreas are in constant competition they're in a legitimacy competition and each one is trying to sort of out Korea the other and this is why North Korea, for example, calls itself Joseon. This is really important, right? It's like a continuation of the Joseon dynasty. This is why North Korea is constantly rummaging around through Korean history, trying to say that, you know, Gogoryeo or Goryeo was actually most important in the portion of Korea that's currently controlled by the Northern regime. And that South Korea was always sort of like influenced by Japan and stuff like that, right? I mean, for us as outsiders, all this is just sort of preposterous, right? right? But the Koreans take this stuff really seriously. And that's why you get these really like elaborate wild claims about Korea being really old and Korean culture being sort of all over the place and Hangul is this sort of like really scientific language and stuff like that. I mean, some of it may be true, but I think a lot of it is an effort by South Koreans to find a sense of identity, who they are at a time when they are caught in a direct national legitimacy contest with an alternative. And that alternative explicitly markets itself as more Korean than in the South, right? The Korea, South Korea is the Yankee colony. It's the sort of bastardized, multicultural westernized you know version of Korea where everybody wears blue jeans and and eats Doritos and you know goes to Japan and stuff like that and right and North Korea is the real Korea because you know they may be poor but they're still wearing hanboks and they're still speaking the real Korean right again to us as Westerners a lot of that stuff sounds like stuff we would not say after the civil rights movement right right mm -hmm. I mean we would not talk about sort of race mixing and stuff like that we haven't talked this way since the 50s but when I went to North Korea this is one of the things the guides on the trip told us they're like no mixing right no race mixing I mean they said that to us a couple of times which is like shocking and that's some of that but some of that plays here in South Korea because they still kind of have that now it's fading right you know South Korea is a lot better right but I mean you still see this you know I have a you know my wife is a Korean we have a mixed race child and people often stare at my child constantly I mean you just see people in there why well, I get people who come up and try to touch my daughter and stuff like that I mean it's getting better my students aren't like that but you know people who are like 30 40 older generation it's still kind of a big deal and and because of this because this nationalism is so important, the competition with the North is debilitating constantly. And that's where the Hallyu hype comes from. That's where the focus on Japan comes from. Koreans will be much happier and much better settled and more, comf more comfortable with who they are when the division is away. The division aggravates and agitates and gets them all sort of turned upside down and inside out. And which one is the real Korea? And we don't really know. So let's just beat up on the Japanese because we know they're bad because of the colonial period. And, and that's what needs to happen. There's a lot of national confusion in sort of the way they build identity here because of the division. And, and that's where the, the Hollywood exaggeration and the historical exaggeration comes from. Um, let's go back to regional security. Um, I'd like to focus on the South China Sea. Sure. Why is China enforcing this nine dash line? Maybe you can also explain what it is. And is it incompatible with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, how they calculate this uh, Nine right. So my understanding is that the nine dash line, the nine dash line is literally just like someone like drew China's water boundary on a map. And in the way, in the same way that like any atlas draws like a dashed line between states, some Chinese nationalists back in the Republican period did this. This sort of like entered currency somehow in China through a textbook or something like that, or 
My understanding is that that claim dates to the 20th century, though. I don't, I don't actually know, but I believe so. But what does China need this, this, this well, area? They, with I, you know, because it goes really, really far south. Yeah, that, it I is, think that's the is. question, right? Sure, I think it, 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 it's preposterous that it's supported by UNCLOS, right? I mean, UNCLOS has pretty clear rules. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't help that the Americans didn't ratify <laughs> UNCLOS, right? Here I am, an American educating the Chinese on UNCLOS when we won't recognize UNCLOS because the American Navy wants to sail all over the place, but. Um, Right, I mean, UNCLOS creates sort of certain rules for, you know, like how far your international waters extend from your coast and stuff like that, like what counts as an island and what's just a rock and stuff. Um, and, and, so, and this is actually part of the problem in the South China Sea too, right, is there's a lot of sort of debate about the interpretation of UNCLOS and like whether or not if you control this island, you can then sort of like leapfrog the 200 mile border right, the EEZ to like another island. And this is what people argue that the Chinese are doing, right? That they're building sort of like a string of islands, right? And like one island projects a claim and you can build another island within that claim and then that one, right? And so you hear these things, these stories now that the Chinese are building their own islands. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, and it's just, it's, you know, I guess you can do this, right? I mean, like I said, it doesn't help that a lot of, you know, that the United States doesn't follow UNCLOS and stuff like that. But what needs to happen is what I think a lot of people have already noted, right, is that there are overlapping claims between the many littoral states down there, and they all kind of need to find a way to draw a line somewhere, right? And right now what's happening is, you know, what realism would predict, which is that the larger power is basically bullying the smaller ones and projecting force to push the line back. As realists would say, that's probably what's going to happen. As liberals would say, that's kind of like a precursor to conflict and stuff like that. And, you know, if the Chinese really want to sort of play ball and get along rather than bully, they'll agree to these lines. And this is why things like the Spratleys are used as a test balloon, right? I mean, this is why everybody's paying attention. Nobody cares about the Spratleys, right? I mean, the Filipinos aren't losing a whole lot by losing the Scarborough Shoal. I mean, there's nothing there, right? It doesn't really make much difference. And we hear these stories about seabed research and all these resources under the water and stuff like that. But so far, I'm not really sure if that's been proven, right? Maybe there's an El Dorado down there, but nobody knows. The real issue is sort of the sense of like, the creeping projection of China's territorial claims by taking one island after another after another, right? And it creates this sort of bizarre position in which China's territorial claims extend all the way down to Indonesia, which doesn't really exist in any other maritime border in the world. I mean, that's the really bizarre thing. And it's so, so everybody's paying attention. Will the Chinese back off and accept something that's more reasonable? Or will they push through an interpretation of UNCLOS that nobody else accepts? But is this or could this be a stepping stone for a new cynic Monroe doctrine? controlling a vast area uh, right. close to China and, you know, making sure that the United States Navy in 20 or 30 years right. cannot access it anymore. Right. Just like just like the U.S. did with European powers uh, yeah. uh, in the 19th century. I think that Chinese might like that. I think there are enough strong states around China that a Monroe Doctrine is probably impossible here. You know, one of the reasons why the United States could get away with that is because Latin America was so badly fragmented and so weak for so long throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century, it was pretty hard for the Latin Americans to push back on American power. That's begun to change, actually, particularly as Mexico and Chile and Brazil have become genuinely functional states with real capitalist economies and genuine elections and things like that. It's we, we the Americans, we don't bully in Latin America as much as we used to and we cannot, which is certainly a good thing. Um, China, of course, faces that problem right now. I mean, there's just simply no way the South Koreans and the Japanese and, and the Filipinos and the Australians are going to roll over. You know, the Chinese could sort of do like a salami slicing tactic in which they try to bully one state after another after another, right? But everybody learned from, you know, Hitler in the 1930s, right, that, you know, you got to sort of stand together, right, or you'll fall individually. And if the Chinese really start to look like they're bullying individual states, you will kind of see a classic kind of balancing, let's come together and resist the Chinese thing. And my guess is that will be led by the Japanese. And the Japanese are already doing this, right? I mean, they're already talking to the Australians. They're already talking to the Filipinos. They're talking to the Indians. I mean, the Japanese are, in my opinion, the Japanese are very close to balancing now. What is your read on the Vietnamese reaction earlier this year when China announced the building of an oil rig in their territorial waters? There were protests and I would say a surprising lack of repression from the regime there. Um, is this an isolated reaction or do you think it's a warning? Do you see ASEAN maybe as a whole, you know, trying to unite over territorial issues? Like, like I said, I mean, ASEAN could be given purpose if the Chinese really push. You know, my sense is that this is the debate that's happening right now inside Beijing. I mean, they're trying to decide how much can we do this, right? You know, if they're lucky, they can pull off the salami slicing thing, right? In which you sort of, you, you push the Filipinos today, you push the Vietnamese tomorrow, instead of facing everybody at the same time. Again, this is sort of, you know, this is kind of like, this is what Napoleon did too, right? And Hitler, right? I mean, you, instead of fighting all your enemies at one time, you fight them one at a time so you can sort of 
And so if the Chinese can do that successfully, then yes, they can bully their way through the South China Sea. But I mean, people have learned this from history, right? I mean, everybody's watching everybody else. Globalization, social media, cable television, make it much harder for China to sort of act in a sequential way. If the Chinese really start to bully the Vietnamese, which people thought was going to happen, then the other states around Vietnam will sort of come in and and so that's why the Vietnamese are talking to the Americans, for example, right now. Now, I think this is one of the reasons why the Chinese actually backed off, right? Because the, the oil rig thing was getting so much publicity. I mean, it was just like everybody was mm. talking about it. And, like, the Vietnamese were, like, attacking Chinese stores. And Chinese tourists were, like, running for the hills. I mean, it was really bad there for a while, right? And, you know, the, the, this, is, this is the education of the Chinese Communist Party. That maybe they believe their own propaganda about China also being this great civilization that's thousands of years old and whatever and we're amazing and stuff like that maybe they believe that kind of stuff right but they're going to run into a wall of opinion right the vietnamese are certainly not going to sign up for any kind of sinic monroe doctrine or a revival of the tributary system if the chinese really believe that they're in for a real rude awakening and and this is something i mean this is something when i talk to the people in japan that i work with who do what i do i hear this a lot right that if the chinese really push then we're going to reach out i the, you know, Japan is like the big, like, unspoken player in this game, right? I mean, everybody looks at Japan and they say, oh, you know, the average age in Japan is 49, and, you know, Japan is in decline, and they're falling apart and everything else. Japan's the world's third biggest economy. They have a great deal more room to spend on the military if it gets to that point. If it really looks like the Chinese are trying to, like, militarily occupy the South China Sea, the Japanese will get involved, and so will the Australians, and the Chinese will start to meet a hard wall. Right now, everybody is trying to avoid that outcome. And I think there are enough liberals in Beijing who see that who are also trying to avoid it, too. I think it's not clear that the Chinese actually really want this Monroe Doctrine, right? I mean, China's in a tough position because it's encircled by strong economies and big states. If China was like the United States and had a lot of independent room to move, if China was in the middle of Africa, it would absolutely dominate the region. But it's not. It's surrounded by a lot of capable states. Russia, South Korea, China, or Japan, and India, and Vietnam, kind of. And this makes it really hard for China to be this, the, the bully. In that sense, I'm kind of optimistic. Let's talk about the future of the region. Um, as a professor, you interact with students from Korea and the broader region. Um, do you perceive different attitudes in this next generation of leaders? Or will it, will it, will it change the fate of the region? Or do you see the same of the old stuff? I, I, I see. I do, I do think that um, Korean education, which I can speak to, does teach a lot of unhealthy nationalism. On the other hand, I do think the reality of cosmopolitanism in Korea is sinking in. I do think that my students have access to Facebook and Twitter and they do see more foreigners in South Korea and stuff like that that mitigate, I think, the nativism that's taught in the Korean school system. I'm not sure. I can't speak so much to China or Japan on those things. I mean, generally, I would argue that globalization is good in this sense and that it spreads more knowledge more easily to more people about other people. And so in that sense, it should raise tolerance levels, which should in turn reduce nationalism and the threat of conflict that that comes from that. When it comes to sort of the, the debate on multiculturalism in Korea, I support it. It would be nice to see Korea as a, a sort of more plural place. Um, I do think it's somewhat overblown though. Um, I don't actually think that Korea is really all that multicultural. If you actually take out ethnic Koreans who've migrated here, particularly from China, if you take out people related to USFK, contractors, family members and stuff like that, you're only really left with a pretty small number, a couple hundred thousand people. So it's not as if Korea is becoming, going to become like a multiracial society. It's not going to become like Canada or something like that. Or even like Western European countries, which are arguably more multiracial than Korea. And that is probably the, the future of, of tolerance and what international harmony in, in East Asia. I mean, to a certain extent, you have, you know, in Asia, you have nation states in a very traditional sense, right? You've got very clear lines between states that correspond pretty well to national communities. And this creates the possibility for what, like I said, in China they call patriotic education. Japan, of course, is notorious for this in the way it doesn't teach the war to its children. And so the, 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 I worry about this, right? I mean, you, you can have geopolitical balancing. It is possible to balance China, as we were talking about before. But ultimately, the way to really change this is to actually change the education system so that Asians respect each other more and they're more interested in one another. They learn each other's languages and they want to sort of get along and interact more. I mean, in a similar, this is very similar to the American struggle against jihadist terrorism in the Middle East, right? That until education systems in the Middle East change, these people are going to keep coming back and back and back and back. And, and that's what ultimately needs to happen, right? Is that the next generation needs to be raised in a different way. And I think South Korea is getting there, but it's less because of 
a government commitment to it and more because of exposure to the world because Korea is very wired and Koreans travel and they learn English and this is bringing a level of acceptance you know, for diversity, if you will, that didn't exist in previous Korean generations. So we can be hopeful something like that will happen in China. When it comes to cooperation and conflict in the region, are you more optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Uh, should we expect more cold handshakes at future APEC meetings? Um... I'm, I'm actually fairly pessimistic, actually. Like I said, I think that um, Asian states are pretty nationalistic. I also think they're very statist. A lot of Asian states have this kind of post-colonial hang-up with national autonomy and their distinction from others. Um, I think one of the reasons why the Europeans are more comfortable moving towards a super state model is because the European states don't really have a lot of history with that. The Europeans were colonizers, they were not colonized. And so the Europeans don't have sort of the phobias and the hang-ups about stateness and distinction and national identity so much as I think Koreans or Japanese or Chinese, you know, Indians, Indonesians and stuff like that, right? Um, and then, but so this is the future of East Asia. I mean, you know, stateness, right? Statism, nationalism. Traditionally, that has been a recipe in the West for conflict. In East Asia, you have a couple things that suggest perhaps the opposite. One, you have the presence of nuclear weapons. Two, you have the presence of the United States. And three, you have the possibility of learning from history. That is, if Asians are smart, they'll look at what the Europeans did to themselves in the first half of the 20th century and not repeat this. President Park uh, seems to think that Asia should establish a culture of dialogue, uh, Northeast Asia in particular, and so Korea is trying to promote this culture of dialogue through the Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative, or NAPSI. Um, the objective is to focus on simple issues at first, to build trust, and then use that as a stepping stone to more, uh, for more ambitious conversations. Um, do you believe in that? Um, is that just another talk show up? It's a great idea. Um... And I, I'm all for it. I mean, normatively, I'm for it. I mean, the more, you know, talking is better than shooting. This is why I always support negotiations with North Korea, right? I mean, a lot of conservatives say we shouldn't talk to North Korea. We should freeze them out and isolate them completely. To me, that's a terrible idea because that will just provoke them. So it's always better that the Koreans and the Japanese and the Chinese are talking. You know, you mentioned the cold handshake. Well, at least there was a handshake, right? I mean, at least Abe and Xi are in a room together. That in itself is progress. It's, again, it's better than conflict, right? They may not like each other, but at least getting them in the room means they're trying. So to that extent, I'm all for it. I would like to see more meetings and stuff like that in Asia. I'm, you know, I'm all for the East Asian community, East Asian summit, this thing. You know, I mean, they have all these sort of ideas that have been floating around for a long time. That said, I think the reality is that very often these international organizations, these four, collapse into talk shops because of the reasons I just mentioned before, nationalism and statism. You have this real obsession with national distinction and state building, and we're just not going to sort of make compromises to, to, to other states that disagree with us on important things. I think this is crippled ASEAN. I think this is the reason why there's no Northeast Asian security organization, even though many people have suggested it for many years. So I'm all for it. You know, maybe Korea can kind of lead the way, but I mean, Korea's record on these things and dealing with Japan particularly are not particularly good, so I'm not exactly sure if Korea's really a good leader for dialogue. The, the gaps between Korea, Japan, and China are so big that I'm not really sure that this new push would change anything. Um, you, know, you can try, but it hasn't worked in the past, right? I mean, look at these, like, joint textbook commissions in the past, right? I mean, they've fallen apart into acrimony again and again and again, right? So, you know, what's changed? Professor Kelly, to conclude, um, I'd like to go into some futurology with you. Okay. How can we solve this Asian paradox? So, you know, this deep economic integration, but really high tensions. Yeah, I mean, that is the thing, right? You've got economic integration, but persistent political nationalism, right? And this creates a sort of weird gap, right? Where you've got states that don't really talk to one another terribly well, don't really get along with one another, have a lot of competition and tension. But on the other hand, they trade with each other a great deal. That in itself is kind of a tricky... That's a sort of strange outcome, right, which actually requires a good dissertation to explain. I, I guess the best example, I guess the best argument would be to what you'd said before, what the Park Administration wants to do, which is to keep having these meetings and keep talking and just try to work your way through these issues. I do think to a certain extent the American position here in Asia helps to stabilize these things. On the downside, though, the American position does also freeze these conflicts, right? I mean, the American, a lot of people say, well, the American position here keeps these political tensions from spiraling out of control. You could also argue, though, that the American position here reinsures all the players against their own bad behavior, and so Korean nationalists and Japanese nationalists can say any crazy thing they want without consequence because the Americans are here to make sure the South Korean and Japanese governments continue to get along. Professor Kelly, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. 
This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.